Welcome to the Riding in the Weeds podcast, where we tackle life's inevitable challenges from navigating mountain bike trails to overcoming business hurdles and forging deeper connections with pets and people. It's easy to find yourself tangled in the weeds, but we're here to help with insights and strategies that'll get you out of the weeds. Our goal is to boost your performance in both sports and everyday life by sharing essential skills that we've learned along the way. Through tales of our entrepreneurship journey, thrilling biking adventures, and fostering meaningful relationships, your hosts, Natasha Lockie and Ginny Brandon, will guide you on a journey that's not only enjoyable, but also inspiring. Join us to gain confidence that you need to navigate the trails of life. Hello and welcome to episode 67. And this is officially the second episode of season three, which really just means that we took a couple of weeks break without telling you guys. So today we are going to talk about stories, the stories that we tell ourselves that get us stuck in what my friend Melanie Gow likes to talk about is open loops. And how do these stories help us? How do they not help us? And how can we reframe, rewire, and use these stories that we have to propel us out of the weeds? So if you know what I mean by stories, if you've got some loops running around in your head that are telling you things that aren't helpful, stay tuned. So I am Natasha Lockie. I am a performance life and bike coach. I love to teach through the lens of our physical experiences, because I believe that our physical experiences, just like play, allow us to adapt things so much faster into our mental space. And it helps us get out of the constant stories. And of course, we have Ginny Brandon, who is our animal communicator. She is such a wealth of knowledge. And she's got some really, really cool insights to share around this whole stories thing. One that she shared with me the other day that blew my mind. So I'm going to let her get the ball rolling as always. So Jenny, what are your thoughts on stories? Yeah, I think the first thing we can say about stories is that it is human nature and that it is something that you will never eliminate from your psyche or whatever you want to say. This is part of what it means to be a human is to tell stories, I think and to create stories about our life and about our experiences and about other people and other beings. So don't make yourself wrong, for starters, for telling stories. But one of the biggest things that I learned in the process of doing my animal communication studies was that my mentor said that rescuing an animal should not be their story. How often do we meet people I know I'm guilty of this too, that say, this is my rescue dog, or this is my rescue cat or my rescue horse. The problem is rescue is not a breed. It's not anything that an animal can be. You rescued your pet. They went through a situation that they needed to be out of. So whether that was just being astray or some sort of neglect or abuse, they experienced something and now they're out of that. It's gone. So that does not need to define them anymore. I think that's so true to every type of animal being is that we do this. I have a puppy that I got from a breeder and I like to tell people that he was the dopey puppy in the lip. Because people are like, he's so calm. And I'm like, yeah, when he was little, that was one of the things I noticed about him in comparison to the other puppy we were looking at who was not calm. And we label our puppies, our children, our partners, our friends, and we give them a story as well. And then in our world, they can't move outside of that story no matter what changes. I know as a kid, I was labeled as the snotty nose kid that was always angry. And I have family members that when I am around them at 46 years of age, I feel like that is the way they still look at me. And when I'm around them, 
I feel like I'm having to prove that I'm no longer a snotty nosed, angry kid. And it's their story. It's also my story as well. So I can't change how they think about me, but I can change about how I feel about me and I can work to not be triggered. I know that that's what comes up for me because that's what I've been living. And so I live into it or I live out of it and I feel uncomfortable. But if somebody gives you a label, you are a rescue dog. Now, how does that rescue dog ever move into being an amazing, perfectly well-behaved pet and family member? Yeah. And I think one of the things that comes up for me here is so what? So what if you have a rescue dog? So what if you were a snotty, angry child? You're not anymore and neither is the dog. And so when we end up trapping other people in these stories, we limit their potential for them. But we also end up limiting ourselves because just as easily as you can trap a dog in a story, you can trap yourself in a story. And I think that's really where it becomes even more important is making sure that we're conscious of the stories we're telling ourselves. Like I said, you're never not going to tell stories. That's human nature. It's just part of how we function in our world. We have to assign meaning to things. So it's never not going to be something that happens. But could we observe a little more and check in and say, is this story true? Is it helpful? Is it a useful story to tell to myself and or to other people, whether that's about yourself or about another being or person? I think more often we just get hung up in the story and don't even bother to register that anymore. And you're right. I think family members, I think that's one of the places that it shows up that it can be the most harmful when family members don't recognize how an, a grown person is now. I know I've experienced that with my boyfriend's family a little bit, that they just don't seem to register that he and I are introverts. And we don't really have a whole lot of interest in being in large uh, uh, gathering situations all the time. It doesn't mean we don't like you. It doesn't mean that we don't want to see you. It just means that large family gatherings are taxing and we would rather limit our exposure to them. But that often doesn't register because it's the story that is assumed that, well, I love being around family. I want to be around family as much as possible. So everyone wants to do it. I think those stories can be in a way the most harmful is the ones that we assume about ourselves and therefore they must apply to everyone else. Yeah, and we were just talking before we jumped on here. I've been a guide. I've been a mountain bike coach. I've done all of these different things. And in so many capacities, I have this story about myself that I'm not the fittest person. And therefore, I don't want people that I'm guiding to think that I'm not pushing them hard enough or we're not going fast enough or we're not getting to the destination in whatever time, or I'm not giving them the experience that in my mind they want to have, possibly because it's the experience I would want to have. But I am the guide. I am the mountain person. I am the one who goes and does this on a regular basis. And I would go snowshoeing with people and I'd be in a hurry because I'd be out there packing the trail. And so then the person behind me is going a little bit faster. And the person at the end of the group well, they've got it really easy because they're on a paved footpath by that point. And I would be pushing myself. And one day I hired this girl and she led the group and I just brought up the rear and she had been trained as a guide. And in her training, they had taught them the pace that you go at that people can sustain for a really long time. And it was absolutely incredible just how beautiful and moderate this pace was and I realized in that moment that I had been pushing people going and doing anything with me was an extreme experience (laughs) and there's probably a reason why I called Betty Gohard an extreme action sports community and even in that 
I was like, no, I don't mean extreme as in like going and doing the X games. I mean that if you're a beginner mountain biker or a beginner snowboarder, that's extreme in your world. But when I actually reflect back on it, I think it's because I do everything to the extreme. And it's because of the story of needing to prove myself and that I'm worried that people are going to see something that I don't want them to see because I have this story running in my head. So if we don't stop and pay attention, it really does have this crazy ripple effect, which might not be detrimental, but it is kind of funny when you stop and and look at it. Yeah. Well, and now you can see how your story had an impact on other people. And that story was really about you. It really had nothing to do with other people. It was based on your fears and your concerns about the experience you were giving them. You were trying your hardest. You were trying your best to do what you felt was good for them to do and what they wanted. But I think that's a great example of where it would be useful to check in with other people to find out what their story is. And that's not to say that those experiences aren't useful because I certainly know I have had plenty of stories that have been the opposite where I didn't think I could do things. And so someone pushing me through intentionally or unintentionally that forced me to step up and find out that my story wasn't true. That, no, I had more capacity to do something like even riding a bike. I had a story that I had medical stuff go that went on as a kid and that my body wouldn't handle certain things. And I still believe that's probably true to a certain extent. I don't think it would be a good idea to put my knee through skiing. It's just the way the mechanics of the sport are and the way the mechanics of my body are is probably not a good idea. If for some crazy reason I decided I really wanted to ski, I could probably figure it out. So in that case, yes, my story is limiting me, but I'm also aware that I could rewrite that story if I really wanted to. Adaptive sports now are so amazing and technology is so amazing that I'm pretty sure I could figure out a way to do it. But there's also alternatives. So do I need to change that story? Do I want to change that story? I think I'd rather go snowshoeing or cross country skiing than actual downhill skiing. It's just who I am and that's fine. So sometimes knowing your story and going, yeah, that one's okay, I don't have to change that. I don't need to change that. But I think it's important we stop and ask those questions. I agree with you and I think what you've said has really made me reflect. You're absolutely right. I am a great coach for people that want to move. Maybe they don't even know they want to move, but because of the way that I don't see limitations and I look at where people are and then I go, well, we can get you to here. And now I've reflected and over the years I've change my behavior because I'm aware. I'm like, okay, hold on a minute. I am a lot fitter than most people. I am, I am diff, different in my way and this is who I am. And so therefore this is what I can offer. And I've adjusted and I ask more questions and I'm much more open. This was very early on in a lot of my career and it's made me better at being the person that will not see your limitations in the same way. I'm very much aware and I will take them into account and we'll talk about them, but I'm also not going to see you as your story. I see you as the potential and the possibility that you tell me you want when you show up. You know, it's I'm here to go on a snowshoeing adventure and I want to learn how to snowshoe, but I'm not very fit. So I'll probably be at the back of the group. Like, great. Awesome. Well, there's all of you are going to be at the back of the group because everybody said that. And I also know that all of you are wanting to be here to do this. So we're going to go out and have a whole lot of fun. And (laughs) with that information, I can make sure that I structure the experience in such a way that nobody's actually going to feel like they're in their story. And I don't, not everybody can can be last. (laughs) Not everyone can be last. Or I used to tell people, they'd be like, oh, I don't think I want to come. I'm not very good. I'm pretty slow. And I'd be like, have you got a backpack with all of the biking gear? You've got a tube and a pump and a tool in there. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, perfect. I'm not bringing my backpack today. 
because you've just told me you're going to be at the back of the group. So that means if I have any problems, I can just sit and wait for you. And you've got all the stuff that'll fix my issues. So you've actually got a super valuable job. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. I'm an important person in the group. But yeah, none of us are bringing our gear. The camel. <laughs> and it's interesting. Yeah, because like, now that changes their story. Now they're not the one at the back being slow. They're actually in the perfect place because, and we're going to wait for you because we need you. So we can't leave you behind. Yeah. Because you've now got a really important role to play. And just by changing that narration that we have, I think we can completely shift how we see our stories. Yeah. Well, and I'm also sure that that person that had that story that you gave a job to so that they felt needed and important, I'm pretty sure they probably kept up just fine. Absolutely. Because so we they wouldn't... learned they were able to change their story because you gave them some new beliefs and you gave them something that was important and responsible to do and they were fine. No, and we wouldn't have invited them if we didn't think they were going to be fine. And that I think is something that in mountain biking anyway, it's like no one's a, it's not a powder day. So we don't really care if we stop in the forest and wait for you. And if we're going on a bike ride where we don't want to stop and wait for someone, we're not going to invite the people that we know we're going to have to stop and wait for. We will plan a different bike ride. And those are the ones we'll invite you on. We get so stuck in that story that it stops us from saying yes to things when the people around us are perfectly aware. And if they're not, you tell them, well, I'm not very good. And they go, oh, okay, well, we'll go and ride this trail. It's about that communication. And it's about communicating, I think, with the voice in your head as well. Like we have this voice in our head that, and I tell people that pedal too much. So when you're mountain biking, you generally pedal when you don't need to. And the reason why people pedal when they don't need to is because doing nothing on a bike, but just cruising along level pedals, suddenly there's that voice in your head starts saying a whole lot of stuff. It might be stuff that's unrelated to biking, which then you're losing your focus, or it might be talking shit to you in which case you start to feel bad about yourself. And so in order to avoid that, you pedal because that gives you something to do. And everyone I've ever said that to, they're like, oh, you're right, because it's actually really hard to be still, whether you're riding a bicycle or sitting in the forest or sitting in the bath. It's so hard to be still because that voice always needs to have something to say. And if we can actually recognize the voice and be like, oh, hey, bud, nice to have you on board actually wanted to spend some time in the quiet can you just lie down and do shavasana with us we're actually in quiet time right now are you cool we can't get rid of the voice but we can become friends with it yeah well and you can ask it well that's a mighty interesting story you're telling me now isn't it (laughs) that's the point i think the more we can observe what's going on the more empowered we can be to make different choices But when you're allowing the story to dictate your actions or how you treat other people or how you treat other animals or whatever it is, when you allow that story to be what decides how you behave, that's when it's not really useful. And that's when it can get in the way. It can hurt other people. You can hurt yourself with those stories. How often do we tell ourselves stories that are harmful? Whether that's as simple as I can't do that trail, I'm not strong enough or fit enough, or I'm not smart enough to do that. I'm not good at math. As women, we get exposed to a lot of stories about women. And I think that can end up defining how we approach the world. And I think that's why it's important for people to show up and show what women can do. And just be present in places where women may not have been common before. It doesn't mean we're going to perform the same as men. That's fine. I'm not expecting to. But I have every right to be in a lot of those places that have been typically male dominated. In some cases, women are going to excel. And in some cases, we're not. But that doesn't mean that we can't be there. But how are you going to change that story if you've never seen someone do that? That applies to really any minority group. How are you going to change that story when you don't know anyone who's had the story before? It's just like the first person to accomplish something has the hardest time. 
the first person to break a speed record for a mile run or, or climbing Mount Everest or whatever, that first record is the most difficult. And once that record is made from there, the next several times that record is broken is usually in quick succession. Within a year or two, that record may be broken multiple times because now everyone knows it's possible. And I think that's what happens with our stories is when we get stuck in our story, it's like the record that's never been achieved. We have that story that gets getting told over and over and over again. And until someone comes along and says, hey, you can do that. Here's how. Then we're going to stay stuck. But until we start evaluating our own stories, then we can't empower ourselves to change it. And we have the power to do it, but we've got to be able to be objective and observe, and then make different choices. Absolutely. I think the other thing too that is really interesting is noticing how often do you tell yourself a good story? And because you're not telling yourself a good story, how often do you actually let good things that happen just pass you by? I was just in the kitchen talking to my husband about when we shut down our store and I was in my story of shutting the store down. And when I reflect, I had a couple of people come and pick up my dog and take my dog for a walk. And I had forgotten that my friend's kids had met my dog. They're like, yeah, no, we took Tiaki for a walk that day. And I'm like, when was that? And my friend's mom had met my dog because the same thing, they took Pearl and Tiaki out for a walk. And I had forgotten. I was so in my story of what was going on. I had all these people come and help me pack stuff up and and just come and support me in a way that if they hadn't have been there, it would have been way harder. But it's not until I actually took a moment to reflect back and be like, oh, I could tell myself the story of whatever I wanted to around that time. But it's not very often that I'm telling myself the story of, wow, there were so many people in the community that came in and bought stuff from us. There were so many people in the community that came in and said shutting the store and how much the store meant to them. There were so many of my friends that came and took my dog for a walk or helped me pack stuff into boxes or did something to help ease that experience for me. And I'd kind of forgotten. And honestly, there isn't much of a story that I'm telling that's negative around that time, but I was stuck in the experience. But if I ever want to feel like I do have community support or remind myself that there are people that care about me. There's a whole lot of stories that I could be telling that are actually really good stories. We forget about those because we're too busy telling the negative ones. And I think that's the other side of it is, okay, so you've got this story. Well, is there another story that could combat that? Yeah. And I think that's the same sort of idea behind the rescue animal is they were rescued, but what's their story now? And there's so many good things that have happened to them since that point in their life. They now have a good life. They have a home that's caring. They have a place to be. They have people that love them and want to give them a good life. So why are you still telling the story of the trauma? when their life now is amazing. Yeah. And I think we do that to ourselves. We do that to each other. We do that to our pets. So I know you have good stories. I know everyone has good stories. But like you said, how often are you telling them? And how often do you not because you don't want somebody else to feel bad? So. We're going to actually leave this episode a little bit different than we normally do because next week we're going to talk about taking out the trash. We're going to talk about how we actually work through these stories and use them as a stepping stone to taking action and use use them as a way to actually move forward. And so what I'd like to leave you all with is homework is to observe, not to change, not to do anything. But I really want you to listen to that voice in your head and notice what it is saying. 
and just pay attention to the loops that are open when things happen, when you get triggered. What are the open loops that are running that you're constantly feeding? And are you feeding the good stuff? Are you feeding the bad stuff? What is that voice saying to you? And next week, we're going to talk about some strategies and some tools and some ways that we can essentially take out the trash and go and pick some flowers instead. What do you have to add to that, Jenny? I love it. I think that's great. So yeah, reflect, reflect on some stories, see where you're at. And you might just find you've got some really good ones that are rolling around in there that you just don't pay attention to. And you might be able to adjust some of them. So with that, we're going to let you go. And thank you so much for joining us. We are really excited that we are essentially in our third year of this podcast. And we've got some really exciting ideas and thoughts and things that we are brewing in the kitchen over here at Riding in the Weeds. And we really, really want to thank you for joining us on this journey so far. If you are here and you've been listening, we would love for you to share this episode with your friends. If you think that somebody could benefit from this episode, share it and let them know that you care about them. If you can, please take a moment right now to go over to whatever platform you're looking at and leave us a review. We read all of them. We love them. We love to hear your comments. We love your feedback. So please just keep sending it in and we look forward to hearing from you. If there is a topic you'd like us to talk about, throw it our way and we will noodle it around. I am Natasha Lockie. I am findable at Betty Gohard and Natasha Lockie on Facebook. And as I said before, I am a life performance coach. I'm here to help you perform better in your day-to-day life, for you to really enjoy every moment, find that peace and happiness you're looking for. And if you want to do it without a bike or you want to do it on a bike, I can help you. So reach out and uh, connect with me. What about you, Jenny? Yeah, I'm Jenny Brandon. I'm an animal communicator and energy healer for animals and their people too. If you are looking to take your relationship with your pet to the next level and find more clarity around what they think about life with you, or if you're having behavior problems or challenges that you want to work through so that you're not telling the same story over and over again, you can reach out to me at soulpetconnections.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and now Substack under the same handle. So thank you so much again for joining us today. You can find the podcast at ridinginTheweeds.com and also on all major podcast platforms, as well as Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So thank you again, and we love to hear your stories. So we look forward to seeing you next time. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone.